Hey, everybody, and thanks for joining us for another episode of Biz Books. My name is Gene Marks, and I am here with General Stanley McChrystal. General McChrystal has written um, his new book is called Risk, A User's Guide. First of all, General McChrystal at Stan, I think I can call you. Is that, that right? Good. I, I um, hope that you will. Thank you very much for joining me. I'm glad we have this opportunity to talk. Well, thanks for having me, Gene. I appreciate it. Sure. So um, first of all, if I can just ask you, I mean, people can look at your bio, but just just a little bit of background, if you can say about yourself. Sure. I grew up in a military family. I was born in an army hospital. My father was a soldier. My father's father was a soldier. My four brothers were soldiers. My sister married a soldier. Then I married the daughter of a career soldier, her three <laughs> brothers. Well, you get it, right? I do. So I went in the army. Uh, at age 17, went to West Point at age 17, and then came out and spent the next 34 years after graduation in 1976 in the Army. Okay. And so on the one hand, I had some very interesting different experiences, but I was part of a big bureaucracy. I mean, that's what a military force like that is. So I had sort of two pulls. On the one hand, I had to pull toward a normal organizational culture, structure, and processes and then I also was part of special operations for most of that career, where we became in a very adaptable kind of organization. And, and that tension was an interesting experience to be part of. All right, great. So this book is called Risk, A User's Guide. My audience are, are business owners, for the most part, and business managers as well. But um, who's your audience for this book? Well, as you notice from the title, it's aspirational, it's ambitious. Right. And it is because someone sees this on the shelf and they go, a user's guide, am I a user? And the question is, of course you are. Everyone is a user of risk, whether they choose to be or not. We all have a different relationship with risk, but the reality is we all experience it. It's particularly focused for owners of small businesses, for chief operating officers, for chief financial officers, who operate in a world where they've got to take information, take decisions, measure risk, but also maybe more importantly, prepare their organization to be effective in a, a risk-filled environment. Yeah, okay. Um, Stan, what is a risk immune system? Yeah, well, I guess we start with what is risk. Okay. And traditionally, you think of it as the intersection, or I did, of the probability of something happening and the consequences if it does. Okay. So for example, if I climb up on the roof of my house, what's the probability I fall off? And what are the consequences if I do? Well, now I think about it a little bit differently. I think about risk as a mathematical equation. And the two components are threats mm -hmm. and vulnerabilities and make it Mathematical threat times vulnerabilities equal the risk. And so, for example, if I have no threats in my life, if I live in that land of Oz where everything's taken care of, then I have no risk because anything times zero is zero. But I don't live in that world and nor do any of the people I know. There are lots of risks and we're not very good at predicting them or knowing exactly what form they'll take. And then you say, well, what are my vulnerabilities? That's my ability to deal with threats. Mm. Well, I can't control that completely, but I have a lot of control over that. I actually can make myself and my organization more capable of dealing with threats. So now we talk about the human immune system. People wonder about what it is, and most of us don't really understand it, but it's a miracle. And every day, our body, is in, we ingest about 10,000 microorganisms, any one of which could kill us or just make us sick. And yet we don't get up in the morning worried about our human immune system working. Because it just on a constant basis, it detects threats to us. It assesses each of those. It responds to those, typically kills the threats that are dangerous. And then it learns from the process. So it's better next time. Well, what I would argue is we never die from something like HIV AIDS. No one ever did. And you say, well, wait a minute, it's deadly. 
No, what it does is it weakens our human immune system. So we're now vulnerable to other things that we normally would not have to worry about. Right. Well, in an organization, we have the equivalent. We have a risk immune system. And that risk immune system does the same four thing. It detects threats, it assesses them, it responds to them, and it learns from it. But it's not a physical thing. It is a set of factors. We've identified 10 for the purposes of understanding how it works. Things like communication, narrative, diversity, action, adaptability. And together, they make a system that allow us to respond to those many threats that arise to our business, to our nation, to our families, and to allow us to be what I'd call risk fit. The things that we do that make us uh, hardier in the face of the unexpected that suddenly arise. Are you saying though, with a risk immune system, and we all we all have like like our own, you know, our own biological immune system. We are born with that. Um, it can be supplemented uh, in some cases by uh, you know pharmaceuticals or 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 healthy behavior and things like that. Are you saying that's the same for a risk immune system as well? Well, in a sense, although forget the pharmaceutical part. <laughs> If you start with the understanding and the conclusion of the book was the greatest risk to us is in fact us. Right. And that comes from the fact that many years ago, they did a, a survey with a number of CEOs on what are the greatest risk to their companies. And they all listed external things. And then they looked at companies that failed and the vast majority had failed based on internal weaknesses. And so you say, well, what can I really do to make my organization more survivable, stronger? And the answer is, of those 10 risk control factors, like the quality of communication in our organization, how well we get the word to the right places at the right time, is it, does it arrive in a clear way? Can people understand it? That's something we can work on. That's something we can make better. Our diversity, which is really the range of different perspectives you need to, to provide a full spectrum understanding of a threat and craft a solution, that's something we can work on. With intentionality, while the greatest risk to us is typically us, we're also our greatest opportunity. Nice. So we have the ability to address our risk immune system, both the individual risk control factors but also the, the health of the system itself. So what we do is we make ourselves more risk fit and we make the organization more capable of responding to any risk. If we think about those, those risks that in our memories that were big deals, mm -hmm. a financial crisis, a natural disaster, uh, something that happens internal to our company, and we look at our response, I would argue that about 80% of what you do in all those different, very different uh, threats is the same. You have to communicate well. You have to align on a clear narrative so everyone knows what they're doing. You've got to be able to overcome inertia and act. You've got to be able to get the timing of your actions right, and so on and so forth. Only about maybe 20% of responses to any risk like that is unique to that particular situation. Mm. So the 80% are being in good shape, being a healthy, well-functioning organization, then capable of making those unique adaptations for that particular situation. That's great. Um, you know, you, you talk about why it's so hard to, to communicate risk. Um, and, and, you know, you also give some ideas to, you know, some tests, some strategies for determining if your communication is effective. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Why is it so hard to communicate risk? Sure. And Gene, I'm going to start with a story. Um, early in my career. Is it the operation... Eagle Claw mission story? Is that what you're going to talk it, about? It is. Good. Operation All right. Tell us. Eagle Claw. <laughs> right. Um, early in my career, I was a young special forces lieutenant and I was in Thailand at the time. And an operation occurred, which changed the rest of my career. And I wasn't even on it. Okay. But many people will remember this operation. In November 1979, Iranian students seized the American embassy in Tehran. 
Now, this was about 10 months into the Ayatollah Khomeini's takeover of the country of Iran after the Shah was forced out and the Iranian Revolutionary Government. And what had happened was students overran the embassy and a number of Americans working there were made hostage. Some were released, but eventually it boiled down to 53. Now, this became a diplomatic crisis of the first order. And just to give a little context for people, this is near the end of the 1970s, which is a tough period for the United States, just a few years after uh, Vietnam. And President Carter was in the last year of his first and ultimately his only term in office. And he wanted to bring the Americans home because that's his job, but also for political reasons. He knew he couldn't be reelected unless he solved this problem. Well, they tried for several months to work a diplomatic solution and they were unable. And finally, the planning which they had put in, into train to come up with a rescue option was brought into the president. And the president was briefed on the plan and that plan was to go into downtown Tehran with American special operators and rescue the Americans and bring them out. And you have to get into the moment here. First, to understand how difficult the mission was. Going into the capital of a country that is entirely denied to the United States is hard enough. Mm. Second, you're bringing out 53 hostages, a large number of people, and you've got to locate them inside a 27-acre large American embassy compound. So you got to get into the city, get into the compound, find the Americans, release them from their captors, and then you've got to get them out. So it's a incredibly difficult. Yep. Now, two really accomplished soldiers were brought in by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and they were brought in to brief the president, and they did. And then the president asked General Jim Vaught and Colonel Charlie Beckwith what he thought their probability, what they thought their probability of success was. Mm -hmm. And they responded 85%. The president approved of the mission. And of course, we know historically it was a dramatic failure. Now, you got to put yourself back into the situation. Everyone in that room wanted the mission to work. But if you looked at the mission, the concept of the operation they came out with had 10 phases to it, which began with helicopters and fixed wing aircraft infiltrating into a deserted piece of desert. And then they transload the raid force from the fixed wing aircraft to the rotary wing aircraft, the fixed wing aircraft exfiltrate out of Iran, the rotary wing aircraft fly to the outskirts of Tehran, the capital. And then because daylight is approaching, they have to hide for a full day. Incredible. <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. And, and then that afternoon, trucks are going to come out, pick up the raid force, drive to the embassy, and there would be a, a raid, which was expected to involve a firefight. Then to get out, assuming they rescued the hostages, the helicopters were going to fly into the soccer stadium, which was next door to the embassy. The raid force would take the hostages there. Everyone would get on the helicopters and you take off. Mm. But you don't have enough fuel to get out of Iran now. Mm. So they've got to seize another airfield, <laughs> land the helicopter. Well, anyway, the mission fails. Yes. And we look now at it. We say that there were 10 phases to the mission and every phase is dependent upon every phase before it being successful. Mm. So failure of one and it's over. And even if you say that each phase, some of which were more difficult than others, had a 90% chance of success, and that's probably a bit generous, and you stop and say, well, 90%, so we got a 90% chance of the mission, so okay, that's good. But that's not the way probability works. Mm -hmm. It's really 0.9 times 0.9 tens times, which is 0.345, which means that had they been in the Oval Office with President Carter, a submariner by initial background and education, and he asked them, well, Colonel and General, what do you think? If they'd said, well, sir, it's just under 35% probability of success, what do you think the chances that he would approve it? Probably zero. Right. 
But the reality is we need to be more understanding than that. We need to understand that this is two special operators communicating to a submariner turned politician. So he doesn't really understand the frame of reference for what they do. So they're communicating something unfamiliar. They are telling him 85% because they believe it. They have planned it. They want it to go. They have confidence in their people. So they're exuding part of the understandable confidence. Now, the recipient of the information, President Carter, very much wants the operation to work because he's the president and he can't be reelected without it. And so there are a number of factors in that room. So we say we didn't communicate risk effectively in that case with tragic consequences, mm. but it's understandable. We need to understand that too often in our lives, we don't communicate risk or receive it and act on it in a particularly objective way. It's very subjective. And we need to understand that. We need to build into our, our systems and our understanding of risk and appreciation for that reality. So you talk about four tests to, to communicate, you know, to make sure that it's effective. Can you, can you weave those four tests into this story? Ab absolutely. And the four tests start with, can you communicate? Do you have the physical ability to get the information from A to B? Okay. And the answer is, often we can't. We don't have the phone number. We don't have connections. In this particular case, you have the two decision makers brought face to face with the recipient. So the reality is the first test, they could physically pass the information. Okay. The second is, will you pass it? And you say, well, of course you will. No, how many times you've been in an organization where somebody won't pass information either because information is power or because they don't know who else needs the information. They're not familiar with that or they're busy. There are all kinds of mundane reasons why we choose not to, to pass information to the next place. Well, in this particular case, you've got the two decision makers. They are willing to pass the information but I put an asterisk on that because they're willing to pass the information as they understand it. So with their inherent biases in it, but they are still willing to tell the president. Mm -hmm. They didn't tell him, Mr. President, there are 10 steps that could be less than 35% because they, they hadn't thought of it that way. Right. And then there's a third uh, test. And the third test is, is the information accurate and timely and relevant? So is it the right information? Now, I would argue in this particular case, they probably failed. Because while the information was what they believed to be true, in fact, the information was undoubtedly flawed because it didn't contain the complexity and the, the, uh, the risks inherent in many of the factors so that the president got information that said, oh, okay, mm -hmm. he got 85%. They believed you know, it, it was it, it, true, Not to interrupt you, but you, are you write later on about you know, the importance of technology you know, in, you know, in making risk you know, decisions. And, uh, and here, when you think about these decisions being made, this was in 1979, 1980, the lack of intelligence, the lack of technology, you're right. People were making decisions really halfway in the dark. Uh, probably three quarters of the way. That's right. Mm -hmm. And then the final test, and I think we failed number three, but even so we go to number four and we say, does the receiver, the recipient have the ability to understand it? If you pass information to me and it's in a language I don't understand, or it's com complex in an area that I don't have expertise, it really doesn't mean to me what you want it to when you send it. And I would argue that President Carter arguably didn't have the expertise in special operations to ask the very pointed questions, to appreciate the fact that these two officers had a certain bias. So I would answer they probably failed number four as well. But how often in our organizations do we fail at one or more of those tests? Right. And we don't know it. And so what I would argue is one of the things we can do in our organizations is we can one, focus on this, but we can also test it. We have the ability to do communications checks to make sure that the pipes are there, they're clear, people understand 
so that before the crisis, we know we have the ability to pass critical information. You know, this, you, you, you talk about to, to, to solve a problem, you have to, first of all, know what the problem is and, and be able to assess the risks of that problem. And to me, that is, that's like the crucial part of this entire book is, is not how you address risks that are affecting your business, but truly, truly identifying what they are and how they can impact you. And uh, that, you know, that example where you, you were saying, I mean, you had people going in there with an 85% probability, they're saying to the president when really, you know, you, like you said, it was closer to 35%, um, just has an enormous impact on the ability to make a decision. What is, um, Stan, what is, what is narrative misalignment? And, and why does that increase risk? What do you mean by that? Right. Narrative is what we tell ourselves about ourselves and what we tell others about ourselves. <laughs> it's essentially our story. Right. In 1957, then Vice President Richard Nixon goes to Ghana in Africa, and he goes for Independence Day, representing the United States. And he is socializing after the event, and he goes to a a black man and he says, making conversation. So how does it feel to be free? <laughs> and the gentleman looks at him and said, sir, I wouldn't know I'm from Alabama. <laughs> and of course that had to have been jarring in the moment, but oh my God. The, the real nexus of the story is that President Nixon was reflecting America's narrative. America's narrative is the land of the free. Mm. It is the land of opportunity. But the man was reminding the vice president that that narrative isn't accurate for every American, particularly in 1957 in Alabama, that was more an aspiration than a reality. And so here's where you get what we call the can or the say do gap. Mm -hmm. We say one thing and we do something different. The reality is different. You know, I tell people the story of the Alamo and they go, well, you know, that's it's really a more complex story of the Alamo because 180 plus uh, Americans, largely Texicans, as they call themselves, defend this Alamo bravely against the attack by Mexican troops. But you could make an argument that the Mexicans had much more legal and moral authority in the situation than the Texicans. Right. And I say, it doesn't matter. The power of the Alamo story is entirely in the narrative after the fact because it has become representative of a set of ideas of brave people standing up for, in this case, independence and, and what's right and, and dying. And so it gets a power all its own and narratives do that. Organizations align around narratives. When it was founded, Google was looking for the values it would espouse. Yep. And one of their employees said, don't be evil. Right. And at first it wasn't, taken, it wasn't taken seriously. People say, no, no, that's not a real value. And then they kind of bounced around and they go, well, actually it's, it's a real good value. Well, we won't be evil. And they mm -hmm. put it on things. They, they trumpeted the saying. And then they made the decision to start working with the Department of Defense, the United mm -hmm. States Department of Defense on a project called Project Maven. And they were essentially doing early stage artificial intelligence to process information from aerial surveillance activities. Now, the leadership thought that that was fine. And, and I personally think that was fine. But there were members inside Google that felt that that was being evil. Yep. So what they had was they had a gap between what they were saying was their value, their narrative, and what they were actually doing. And it created quite a firestorm inside the organization. A little revolution occurred inside Google. And what it should do for all of us is highlight the fact that it is critical that organizations and societies have a clear narrative they're aligned on and to understand the risks when you are not. So we've talked about the failed Eagle Claw mission. We've talked about President Nixon's gaffe. Uh, you, we've talked about Google and, and how Google shouldn't be evil and how powerful that narrative can be. Um, let's talk about Lehman and the financial crisis that you, you wrote about um, as, it, as it relates to the structure of an organization. Um, to really address risk in your organization, you have to have the right kind of 
structure that can identify it and handle it. Um, talk to me a little bit about that. Absolutely. In most organizations, when you're very small, you're a very loosely organized team and everybody just can get it done. Then when you grow at a certain point, you get organized. Mm. Somebody comes in and says, we got to get organized. We got to have people in human resources and finance and different functional areas and sometimes geographic. And, and there's goodness in that. There's goodness because it clarifies responsibilities. It identifies process routes for information to travel. It lets people from the outside dealing with the organization know who to call and deal. It just gives a clarity to things. Right. But we need to understand that structure is always a two-edged sword. Because what structure can do, it can enable and clarify and put discipline into processes. It can also inhibit just as easily. If the structure has inherent flaws and everybody is working in their office or in their particular area, it's akin to a military unit defending a place and leaving some foxholes empty. Because mm -hmm. somebody, somebody thought first platoon was gonna occupy the foxhole and somebody else thought second platoon was, and suddenly you've got a structure and you've got a gap I see. between it because the structure created that and everybody is happily going along saying, well, the structure solves all problems, it clarifies all things. And in reality, it can, it can do the opposite. In Lehman Brothers, they knew that they were dealing with risk because investment organizations do that. Mm. They make decisions to seek a rate of return based balanced against risk. And so they hired a chief risk officer. And so if you've got a chief risk officer, you have checked the block. We are taking care of risk. But then they buried her in the structure so that she was not in the investment committee. Right. She was not there when the critical risk decisions are made. At the same time, the organization has something which we could call a moral hazard. Everybody thinks that risk is covered because we have a chief risk officer. Therefore, I don't have to worry about risk. Right. And right. so your structure can become something that creates weaknesses. And it takes a very intentional effort to focus and understand how the structure connects so that you can avoid critical, uh, weak, critical vulnerabilities. Incredible. So even in an organization like Lehman, I mean, you know, they, they, they had good communications. They, they had the right narrative of them being a financial services firm and avoiding risk. They hired a risk. Imagine being that woman having that job with all that stuff, you know, happening. And yet because of the way they structured their organization, all of that failed them. Right. Um, and, 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 and so no matter how much risk that they were assuming that they might have, um, you know, they're, they're, it, it failed them. And that, that's an issue, you know, um, it brings me to the next, really, I'm going to combine two topics that you also talked about in your book, which is diversity and bias. I mean, you used uh, President Kennedy's example with that as groupthink, um, which I'm going to ask you to expand on. But, you know, there's been, and, and Bernie Madoff, you talk about the Iraqi war, how all of these kind of factors um, increased risk to the people that were trying to make decisions. And, and nowadays, there, there is a big narrative about increasing diversity and decreasing bias uh, in an organization. And it, this really hits home to the fact that having as diverse an organization as possible, reducing bias to the extent that you can, it really does reduce risk in your organization, right? Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Tremendously so. I think the first thing is to sort of uh, define both terms as I use them. Sure. In terms of bias, we immediately want to say, well, it's racism or something like that. No, bias is something we all have. Right. It's like fog on our glasses. It is whatever particular corruption of fact that we take in compared to what we see. And some of our biases are very harmless. Some of them can be very harmful, but we need to understand that we all have them. And then organizations often build up organizational biases. In the book, we describe the South during the age of slavery. And people say, well, the South was full of all people who were inherently racist. And I would argue, we don't know that. What we do know, it was financially in their best interest to maintain the free labor slavery system. 
And so they believed in slavery mm. because it was in their interest to make that conclusion okay. that African Americans were proper improper or properly enslaved. Now, of course, we know that's wrong, but we can understand why, but it also should wake us up. How many biases do we have because it represents something that is in our interest that we are sort of spring loaded toward? Now, in the case of diversity, when I talk about diversity, I don't talk about equal opportunity. Equal opportunity is everybody gets the same chance to do things. And that is legally required and it is morally right. But I would argue diversity is more about a diversity, a broader spectrum of perspectives, of experience. And so while diversity is not a legal right, diversity is a business imperative because it makes an organization better. In 1961, brand new President Kennedy had just entered office and he was briefed on a plan that became known as the Bay of Pigs. And the plan was put together by the CIA and President Kennedy asked the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to get the military leaders to, to review the plan. But for security reasons, uh, it was pretty tightly held. And what happened was they went through this decision-making process and a, a fairly reluctant, skeptical President Kennedy still approved the operation and it was a complete failure. Mm. And it's not surprising. When you look at the plan now, the plan was not well thought through, not particularly well coordinated, and it was poorly executed. And so it failed publicly. When they looked at the failure after the fact, what they found was you had a group of people that were brought in essentially to the decision-making process and while they had different last names, they were basically all old white guys, mm -hmm. some young white guys, because that was 1961 U.S. government. Mm -hmm. But the more the brightest. Brightest. Yeah, <laughs> but, but more dangerously, they all had pretty similar perspectives. Mm. And when they studied the operation later, a man named Irving Janus came up with the term groupthink, which we all know now. Mm. And basically, he identified that there were dynamics in that group that suppressed people from disagreeing, right. sort of coerced other people into aligning up on the idea. It created this idea that because everybody else believes and they're smart, accomplished people, I better believe because I wanna be a smart, accomplished person. And he came up with a series of indicators and it was really reflective of what had happened in that particular failure. Well, President Kennedy, luckily went to school on it. And 18 months later, you had the Cuban Missile Crisis. Again, Cuba is the, is the issue, but this time we find Soviet missiles on the Cuban islands, and there's a decision-making process that's implemented. This time, President Kennedy executes a different approach. He creates some, something called an ex-con or executive committee and he brings together people that's still a bunch of old white guys because it's 1962, the United States at this point. But he very consciously brings different perspectives into the room, people with different viewpoints. What he's trying to do is give himself more freedom to think and act, a broader range of potential options. At the beginning of the process, day one, if they had voted and, ex and executed, they would have invaded Cuba. But after a series of days when he, he pushed this process, largely orchestrated by his brother Bobby, he was able to tease out a broader set of options to include what they called a quarantine, mm -hmm. which ultimately probably prevented a nuclear war. Mm. And he did it by getting diversity of thought, right. diversity of perspective. He gave himself greater options. And so... What I would argue is in a business organization now, if you don't have diversity, you are creating blind spots. And those blind spots are incredible risks to you. I was just gonna say you're increasing your risk by not having that diversity. Um, tell me who Dick Fosbury was and what he has to do with being adaptable. Great, if you had seen Dick Fosbury in 1968 in Mexico City, you'd see this tall, thin, 20-year-old guy 
we're in two different color athletic shoes <laughs> and you, you might be tempted to dismiss him. Right. And yet he stands before his approach to the high bar in the Olympic games. He runs to the high bar and then he throws himself over the high bar backwards. Now that's not the way high jumpers jump. <laughs> There've been a lot of different impressions, but he goes over backwards and the crowd starts laughing. And one of the reporters there said the crowd laughed so hard, they barely noticed that he won. And he set an Olympic record and won a gold medal. Hmm. And this 20 year old University of Oregon engineering student had been high jumping for years. He'd studied high jumping. He determined that if he changed the way he went over the bar and went over backwards, he could actually keep his center of gravity below the bar and sort of roll over it. And you say, well, wow, Dick Fosbury is just the most brilliant guy ever. Well, he's pretty smart. But what he did couldn't have been done in earlier years. Hmm. Because for years in high jumping, you jumped over the bar and you landed on maybe some sawdust, maybe nice. some sand. But if you land on the back of your neck, you probably break it. Hmm. And so that kind of backward jump wasn't possible. It wasn't physically survivable. Hmm. But by 1968, we had these big, thick crash pads on the other side of the bar. So it was very forgiving on the, the landing area. So suddenly, two factors came together. The first was changed conditions. It became possible to adapt. Right. And then a person, Dick Fosbury, who has the mental flexibility to say, hey, conditions have changed. I can adapt, and I will. Almost all high jumpers now use Dick Fosbury's technique. So I guess the the point though is that um, you have to be able to innovate. Um, you 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 can't be, as you say in your book, you can't be frozen by the fear of failure, right? You you've you've got to move ahead. Doing you know, being that way increases your risk of a bad outcome. That's exactly right. When we are stuck in what we have always done unless that happens to be the perfect approach, we are absolutely uh, open to the risks of everything else. If we are fundamentally willing and able to adapt, then suddenly we can change to meet the conditions which in a modern environment are constantly changing. And mm -hmm. so it gives us a whole range of options that we don't have if we're single threaded on one approach. You know, dovetailing into that theme is, is you, know, you know, how important leadership is um, for reducing risk and, and adapting to that. Um, you gave some symptoms of weak leadership, having an unclear mission, uh, a lack of a strategy, a failure to follow it, you know, poor communications. Uh, there are plenty of books that are written on leadership. But when it comes to risk itself, you, you tell a story where you're know, comparing General Braddock to to roosevelt and right. if you could share that story and 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 why that impacts the you know leadership and 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 you know, increasing risk if you don't have a good leader yeah absolutely we we tend to want to think of everything hinges on the leader mm -hmm. so the leader makes a good decision or a bad decision and that's the outcome and, and that's not reality right the reality is the ability of the organization to deal with risk is inspired or in some cases constrained by the ability or the willingness of the leader to create that environment, which it happens. So if, if we think of the risk control factors, leadership really goes over them all like an umbrella that creates an environment in which the organization can best react to potential risks. General Edward Braddock was a British regular officer and he came from the Coldstream Guards. He had a traditional British training of European style of warfare. And he was a pretty self-confident individual. And during what we call the French and Indian War, the Seven Years' War, he was given two regiments of British redcoats. Mm -hmm. And from an area right close to where I'm sitting right now in Alexandria, Virginia, he was tasked to go to Fort Duquesne or where modern day Pittsburgh is and capture a French fort. Okay. Now it was hard to get there because it was uh, 200 miles through very difficult terrain without roads, and he had to get wagons and cannon and forces there. So it was quite a logistical drill. But he thought that if he could get this regular British force supported by 
uh, militia and paid contractors who helped, that he'd be able to then defeat the French and Indians because the disciplined nature of British regulars was just going to be dominant on the battlefield. And so he begins this expedition. <laughs> he is constantly advised by people in the organization that have more experience in the wilderness than he, that this is different. This is not Europe. Our opponents, although French leadership was there, the primary forces were Native Americans, American Indian tribes that worked with the French, and they fought differently. And so this was going to be different. One of his advisors and aides was young General, jo or then Lieutenant Colonel George Washington. Mm -hmm. He also had young Daniel Boone driving a wagon for him. But he had a number of other people who were telling him, hey, understand the context of this is different from what you know. Hmm. Now, General Braddock was a competent officer and a brave officer, but he wouldn't listen to this. He wouldn't adapt what they did, nor would he let them adapt. So the organization went forward in a fairly predictable way. Hmm. They got near Fort Duquesne. The French and Indians came out, and the story is it was an ambush. It really wasn't. The French and Indians came out. It was sort of a, they ran into each other. But the French and Indians adapted really quick in the wooded environment. Mm. And quickly, the advantages of the disciplined formations of the British turned out to be disadvantages. Mm. And it turned into this extraordinary route. Oh. And so what General Braddock did was he made his force less effective than it could and should have been by the constraints in which he applied. Got it. You switch that to Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Right. Here's a 50-year-old stamp collector. He's kind of a raised as a dandy, to be honest. He's from mm -hmm. a wealthy background. Mm -hmm. um, and he's stuck in a wheelchair mm -hmm. because he's been hit by polio in his early 30s. Mm -hmm. And so he's pretty easy to underestimate. Mm -hmm. But he takes the presidency in early 1933, which was just when we were starting to get into the depths of the Depression, because it took several years after the first stock market crash to really get entrenched. And there was not much hope in the United States. There was this idea that the American system just wasn't working and it might not ever work again. Right. And what he does is he uses a series of strengths that he has. He's a master communicator. He is able to adapt. In fact, he comes in on a balanced budget platform and looks around once he's in office and realizes that's not the approach. He throws it out and he starts doing New Deal-like activities that involve much greater expenditures. He aligns the country on a narrative. He says, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Right. And he tells everybody, we will solve this problem. We will work our way through it. He assembles a diverse collection, the kitchen cabinet, they called it, of different experts and he brings them together and he uses them in sort of unorthodox ways to leverage the best talent he can bring. He is throughout this sort of a symbolic leader, but also a practical manipulator, you might say, sure. of different things. He makes the government more effective than the government would otherwise be. He makes American society do more than it had been able to do before. It's almost the polar opposite of the constraining effect of a General Braddock. Right. And instead, you've got this more freewheeling leader, unlock American capability, and then launch us successfully into the Second World War. Well, Stan, we're running, we're, we're running close to time, and, and I, I want to kind of wrap up with some of your thoughts about, about what business owners and managers should do um, to, to, to minimize their risk. And, and you talk at length about building the capacity to address risk. Um, you tell stories about you know, what, what lessons were learned from the San Francisco earthquake, what lessons you learned when you took over the 2nd Battalion, the 2nd Ranger Battalion. Um, and, and you talk about you know, detecting, assessing, responding, learning. So as, as, a, as some final thoughts on that, tell us, tell us that story about taking over the 2nd Ranger Battalion and, and tell us how that you know, has, has taught you to build the capacity for reducing risk in an organization. Absolutely. The first thing is I'd use the word intentionality. 
Okay. I took over Second Ranger Battalion in 1994. And it was a good organization. There'd been a fair amount of turmoil in leadership for, for various reasons. So when I took over, the organization needed to get a clear direction, reset the narrative, although the talent was, was clearly there. And so I decided to give very clear priorities. I said, we're gonna do four things. We are gonna be great at marksmanship. We're gonna be great at physical things, road marching, carrying packs a long way, small unit um, drills as we do that. And then medical training, first aid for our, for our uh, uh, comrades. Okay. And you know, you have to train on a lot more things than that. But we called those the big four. And what they were was they served as sort of the guiding direction. Because I told people, if we're good at those four things, we can do anything. They are the basics. They are blocking and tackling. They are whatever you describe as the basics. And we talked about the big four relentlessly and said we will just over and over until we are near perfection at the big four. Okay. Sort of like the power sweep that... Vince Lombardi put in in the Packers. Very simple play, but they executed it just flawlessly. And so we decided to focus on that. And what I would say is when I talk about leaders making your organization better, how many times have you been in an organization, a crisis occurs, let's say a flood or something, you come together, you work real hard. And after a period of time, you look at each other and you go, wow, I feel really good. We're much better than I thought we were. And I'd go, shame on you. Shame on you, because if you wait till that crisis to find out if you're good enough, then you are going to sometimes be sadly disappointed because you may fail and find out we're not as good as I thought we were. Sure. What I advocate for organization is you can do a lot about this. There are a number, and we put a number of solutions in the book, essentially exercises, yep. things like assumptions check, a red team exercise rigorous after action reviews, all of which are like working the muscles of your organization so that the basic capabilities that provide resilience or a risk fitness level can be pushed. Now, you'll never know exactly what the next crisis is going to be. You can't. But what you can do is know how healthy your organization can, is at any given moment, and you can make it more healthy than it otherwise is. You know, everybody, uh, I've been speaking to General Stanley McChrystal, who is the author of Risk, A User's Guide. Um, Stan, you're going to, when, when this comes out, there'll be post-production. Uh, we're going to have your, the, the book cover all throughout this and, you know, and obviously where to, where to get it as well. And by the way, hang around when I stop the recording, please, because I do want to personally thank you for joining us. Just, to, just as a takeaway, just you know, for, my, for my, my listeners and for viewers uh, who are running businesses or managers in your business, it, it really is all about risk and, and reducing risk. You're never going to be able to eliminate it. Just like we will never be able to fully protect ourselves against ransomware or computer viruses, but all we can do is try and eliminate the risk of those. Um, this book really goes through the steps and the considerations with some really fantastic stories about how you can minimize risk uh, in your business and of course in your personal life as well. So Highly recommend that you read it. Again, it's called Risk a User's Guide by General Stanley McChrystal. Uh, Stan, thank you so much. I've, I've learned so much by this conversation and I, I think our viewers and listeners will as well. And uh, thank you for writing this. I hope, you, I hope you add to it in the future. My honor, Gene. Thank you so much. Thank you. And stand by just for just a minute. Thanks everybody for watching this episode of Biz Books. We'll be back shortly with another episode and another great author. So please uh, join us then. Take care.